I was uh, sitting in a coffee shop studying for our passage for today, and a three, maybe four-year-old little boy walked into the shop with his mom. He was dressed in a Spider-Man outfit, and he strode through there as if on a mission. Like he looked right past the server who actually tried to engage with him and, and, and talk to him and compliment and play with him because and, and, he liked the outfit. But this kid was not having it. He just went right past. I think he was going after the muffins at the counter. <laughs> that moment reminded me of a meme that I saw once. And it said this, my boss told me, dress for the job you want, not the job you have. Now I'm sitting in a disciplinary meeting dressed as Batman. <laughs> now I think that's hilarious. Like, I can just picture this guy, like, thinking he's going to have a great day, right? And he dresses as Batman, he shows up, and now he's sitting waiting, waiting for HR. That cute little boy dressed as Spider-Man and the gentleman in a Batman costume waiting for that conversation with his boss have something in common. They are both dressed for the battle of the day. They have something else in common. Both are not actually living out who they really are. Nor does it appear that they are actually ready for the battles of their day. That also seems to be a problem for many people in the world. I know, not you and I, but everybody else. Actually, we too can forget. We can forget who we are. We can we can try to control each situation of our daily lives and we end up running around chaotically attempting to fix everything in our path. We can get trapped thinking that our vote is going to solve our problem or their vote is going to destroy everything that is good. We can exas exas exasperate our children by hovering over them to, to try to keep them from every harm instead of trying to train them how to deal with adversity. We can become nitpicky in our observations of our spouses, of our other family members, of our friends, in a jealous attempt to get them to do things our own way. Now, it is true that an ill-informed vote can cause problems. It, it is true that parents are to guard and protect their children, and it is valid for our family and, and friends to be held accountable at times. There are real problems to contend with. And as beings created in the image of God, we can address the issues of our day and we can offer help. But how we tackle the problems matters. What we think matters. Dressing up and pretend doesn't answer the questions. We must think rightly to live rightly. As we continue our study of 2 Peter, we come to a portion of the letter giving us battle plans for addressing real problems, a plan to enjoy the victory already won for those who are in Christ. Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, 1, Dear friends, this is now the second letter I have written to you. In both letters, I want to stir up your sincere understanding by way of reminder. Peter desires for believers in Jesus to know who they are and walk faithfully with the Lord. Recall in his first letter he wrote, he said this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Peter longs for us to in, for us in Christ to live in hope. No matter the circumstances of life, he calls us to, to know the incredible inheritance believers of Jesus possess. At the beginning of his second letter, he reminds us that we have all we need to live in hope. He says his divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. The apostle desires to stir us up in the truth by way of reminder. He says, I want to stir up your sincere understanding by way of reminder so that you recall the words previously spoken by the holy prophets and the command of our Lord and Savior given through your apostles. Pastor Wayne adds this comment about Peter. 
He says, Peter is a Hebrew man, educated in synagogue school, and by three years of studying under the great rabbi, Messiah Jesus. Thus, it's no great surprise that Peter emphasizes remembrance. It's in his blood. When he goes on, he says, you see, the Jews generally considered this, talking about Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, the Jews generally considered this passage to be the greatest summary of the truth in the whole Old Testament. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7 says this, listen, Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words that I am giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Shema Israel. The word for listen doesn't just mean to physically hear. It intends to seek understanding and obey and never forget Likely, you have seen this. If you have been around children, watching people uh, wrestle with children, you've probably seen this. When a mom asks a child, did you hear me, what does she really want to know? Like, does she only mean, did you hear the words coming out of my mouth? No. She wants to know that the child understood the assignment, is working to remember the instructions, and is doing what has been commanded. Clear communication requires understanding and remembering. Now, I don't know why, but this thought makes me think of the scene from the movie Independence Day. At the point where the two heroes are battling to enter the alien mothership to plant a bomb, there is a breakdown in communication the pilot wasn't aware of a key piece of information from the engineer. And he quips, when were you going to tell me? And the engineer says, oops. The pilot, we're going to have to work on our communication. The battle plan is best served with the correct information consistently known and remembered. And since we, as believers, are soldiers, not the commanding officer, we must learn to listen. Shema. Peter reminds us to listen to the words of the Old Testament prophets and the apostles. Listen to what this gentleman has to say. It's a major concern of mine, and I'm just going to be real about it, because I believe that there are a lot of Christians today that are being influenced more by the news outlets, by social media, and by this world than we are being influenced by the Word of God. And I think a lot of us are settling for looking at the pictures of God's word rather than reading God's word for ourselves. You see, the other day, our granddaughter was at our house. She's just little. She can't read yet. But she picked up this book and she says, Pops, I'm going to read you this book. Now, I know she can't read yet, but she hopped up in my lap and she began to read this book based off of the pictures that she saw. And it was in that moment that I realized that in my early walk with Christ, I was basing all of my beliefs off of what I saw other people doing and what I heard other people say. And you know, you cannot feed your faith based on what somebody else says. You can't feed your faith on something that may actually be a lie. You can't feed your faith and grow in your walk with God based on rumors and gossip or anything else. You have to get in the word of God yourself. This is your relationship with God. This is personal. And you can't settle for looking at the pictures when God has provided you so much life in the text of the book and you can get in it for yourself. Listen, there's nothing wrong with being informed with what's going on in this world, but we cannot be transformed by what this world says. We have to be influenced by the word of God so that we can be transformed by that word. And God brings us into the light. Love you guys. Our problem is not that the engineer forgot to tell us what we needed to know, like we saw in that movie scene a few moments ago. Instead, our good father has given us the gift of his word. And this precious gift of the scriptures is a way of life, a plan to approach each day, a foundation to help us think correctly that we might learn to live rightly, here are a few words for us to remember. Psalm 50 says this, the mighty one God, the Lord speaks. He summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. From Zion, the perfection of beauty, God appears in radiance. Our God is coming. He will not be silent. Devouring fire precedes him and a storm rages around him. 
On high, he summons heaven and earth in order to judge his people. Gather my faithful ones to me, those who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens proclaim his righteousness, for God is the judge. In Malachi 4, we read, For look, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, when all the arrogant and everyone who commits wickedness will become stubble. The coming day will consume them, says the Lord of armies, not leaving them root or branches, But for those who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go out and playfully jump like calves from the stall. You will trample the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day I am preparing, says the Lord of armies. Jude states, but you, dear friends, remember what was predicted by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They told you. In the end time, there will be scoffers living according to their own ungodly desires. These people create divisions and are worldly, not having the spirit. But you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Now, obviously, there are many more scriptures we could look at, but here is what we do know. A plan is laid out. The Lord will judge those false teachers causing destruction. He will take care of the dictators and he will rescue his own people. Remember, brothers and sisters, what the Lord has said. Study the word and don't forget it. For then you will be able to live rightly in purity. That's actually the desire that Peter's talking about here. Our our thinking and acting that we get to possess and live out pureness and holiness. When we think rightly, we can live in purity. But that that isn't easy in a world full of mockery, is it? It's not easy in a world full of mockery. The last passage that we read from Jude just a moment ago, compliments Peter's next point in 2 Peter 3.3, 3, warning us to watch out for scoffers. Peter says, above all, be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days scoffing and following their own evil desires. Scoffers live to destroy. Scoffers long to bring everyone else down to their own vile level. And they will twist and they will turn their words to influence those trying to good to do good from doing good. One of the common ways that we see this battle playing out in our current culture is people taking the idea of murdering babies in the womb and changing the language to describe the atrocious act as women's health care. Scoffers deny the beauty of God's gifts to satisfy their own wants. And Peter warns that these scoffers will particularly challenge the prophet's teaching of the hope of Jesus' return. He says, beginning in verse 4, that the scoffers are saying, where is he, this coming that he promised? Ever since our ancestors fell asleep, all things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. Here's my summary of a typical scoffer's message. There's no problem, they would say. We can be the way we want to be. We are, after all, to be happy. There hasn't been any judgment from God. There won't be any judgment from God. He loves me just the way I am. Or they say, if there is a God, he isn't involved in the affairs of mankind. I can do what I want. And Peter replies, basically, with an, oh, really? Peter points out the reality of the word of God and the Lord's direct engagement with mankind. He says, they, the scoffers, deliberately overlook this. By the word of God, the heavens came into being long ago and the earth was brought about from water and through water. Through these, the world of that time perished when it was flooded. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Scoffers deny that God created the world They deny that God judged the world with a flood and they deny that God will once again judge with fire. But Peter wants us to remember the truth. Peter wants us to remember the words of truth. 
The account of creation in Genesis begins with this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was an evening, and there was a morning one day. It is very important for us to know and remember what the Lord says in his word. Too often, we, we actually try to explain things away without this remembrance, and we then fall trapped in the scoffer's lies. The creation account is vital for our understanding. So when we read in Genesis that God spoke the world into being, what should we do? We should believe him. We should believe him. Now does that mean that we will understand every aspect of how God created the universe, how he put the world together, and how he created man. Will we understand every detail about the how of that? No. We won't. In his book, The Model of Everything, Ralph Brown uses a helpful image for our thinking. Brown describes our life as in a cocoon. All of our time on earth is within a cocoon. He then places this cocoon within the midst of God's existence, which is far greater than our little cocoon of our time on earth. And he then makes this statement. He says, there is an undeniable line drawn in the sand separating our intellectual abilities and limits from God's. Let me read that again. There is an undeniable line drawn in the sand separating our intellectual abilities and limits from God's. But too often, we are like the scoffers or the serpent, and we ask, did God really say? The scriptures tell us that God spoke the world into motion and breathed life into man. Did, God actually, did he actually kneel down physically, put his mouth over Adam like a CPR situation and breathe life into Adam? I don't know. I just hold to the fact that God said it happened. That is faith. Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen, for by this our ancestors were approved. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Hebrews highlights Peter's point. Scoffers will attempt to assuage their own consciousness with the denial of truth. He points out also that they reject God's previous judgment. He says, through these, talking about the waters, the world of that time perished when it was flooded. The scoffers will deny that God judged mankind before with a flood. But we read in Genesis 7, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the sources of the vast watery depths burst open. The floodgates of the sky were open and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Further in the story, it says, every creature perished, those that crawl on the earth, birds, livestock, wildlife, and those that swarm on the earth, as well as all mankind. Everything with the breath of the spirit of life in its nostrils, everything on dry land died. He wiped out every living thing that was on the face of the earth, from mankind to livestock, to creatures that crawl, to the birds of the sky, and they were wiped off the earth. Only Noah was left and those that were with him in the ark. Now many have denied the claims of this story, calling it only a myth. But I find it fascinating that scientists continue to find evidence suggesting the story not as far-fetched as some would like to believe. In an article in the Smithsonian Magazine from April of 2000, we find a description of ocean basins catastrophically flooding. There's a description of the Black Sea that is being deprived of its source of, of water, the meltwater from European glaciers. That water is moving into the North Sea. As this happened, the Black Sea level dropped 
and some of the surrounding area began to show dry land while the ocean level rose. And the article says this. This situation with the world ocean rising while the Black Sea was falling could not last forever. Eventually, like a bathtub overflowing, the Mediterranean had to pour through into the Black Sea Basin. The idea that ocean basins can flood catastrophically during periods of rising sea levels is nothing new in geology. Now, there's a great deal to unpack if you read through those kinds of articles. And there have been lots more studies since. But for now, let's just hold on to this fact and wonder that as time goes on, as time continues for us here on earth, the scoffers are repeatedly being shown that what the Lord's word says appears to hold more weight than they might want to admit. To live in victory, we need to hold on to the fact that even if we cannot fully explain the hows of God's handiwork, it doesn't negate his claims. His promises are true. His promises are true. After all, has there ever been another worldwide flood since the days of Noah? No. Not even the tragic reality for our friends who, who went through Katrina or Harvey or Helene. Those tragedies still do not equate to the judgment of Noah's day. We must pay attention to the scoffer's denial of God's past judgment because it leads them to believe that he won't judge again. Peter says, by the same word, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Isaiah 66, 15 through 16 says, look, the Lord will come with fire. His chariots are like the whirlwind to execute his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. For the Lord will execute judgment on all humanity with his fiery sword and many will be slain by the Lord. John the Baptist declares Jesus' is clearing of the ungodly this way. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but the one who is coming after me is more powerful than I. I'm not worthy to remove his sandals. He himself will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing shovel is in his hand, and he will clear his stretching floor and gather his wheat into its barn. But the chaff he will burn with fire that never goes out. Paul describes to the Thessalonians uh, of God's coming judgment and his people's relief. In his second letter to them, he says, this will take place at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with his powerful angels. When he takes vengeance with flaming fire on those who don't know God and on those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. A scoffer's way is destruction. Their longing to satisfy their own desires logically leads them to scream that none of the prophecies of God are true. Because if they are true, then they will be confronted. Who actually wants to be confronted? I don't in my own flesh. Peter warns believers to watch for the scoffers and not fall for their delusional denials. Scripture gives us a clear picture of how to battle through the chaotic noise. Psalm 1, how happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked or stand in the pathway of sinners or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates on it day and night. Remember the truth of God's word. Remember the truth of God's word. He is righteous. He has made a way for you to live righteously. He sustains you with his power. Everything you need for life and godliness is given to you. Abide in Jesus and you will be like a solid planted tree producing fruit. Kind of sounds like part of some annual theme I've heard. Fruit is produced because of the transcendent mercy of our Lord. Therefore, we need to hold on to his mercy. We need to hold on to his mercy. Peter says, dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise as some understand delay. But he is patient with you not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. One of the most difficult realities for me as a believer in Jesus 
is to wait for him to fix everything. I mean, I'm tired of wrestling with sin. I'm tired of seeing other people act foolishly. I'm tired of my body not working the same way it used to. I'm tired of broken things in my house. I want it all fixed. And like the firm J.G. Wentworth proclaims, I want it now. Some of you remember that commercial. Earlier this week, our dryer stopped working. It stopped doing its one job. <laughs> the, code, the code told us that the airflow was messed up, which meant that the vent needed to be cleaned. So I stopped by the store on the way home, grabbed some tools that would make it easier than the last time I cleaned it, got home, moved everything out of the way, climbed back to the back, cleaned the vent, cleaned around, moved everything back and started the dryer. Then a new sound emerged. <laughs> All I did was clean it. So then I decided to get to the other side of the dryer that I hadn't gotten to, I didn't think I needed to, which meant I had to move the washer out of the way and climb behind. <laughs> so I jumped behind, took some videos of the dryer to try to watch and listen for what might be happening inside there. I waited a little while sitting behind this, the, the washer and after some time the sound disappeared. I don't know what it was still. So I moved the washer back and started a new load. I returned in just a little while to make sure the dryer was still doing its job drying and I noticed water on the floor. I didn't even undo those hoses. But there was water on the floor. Somehow I had moved those, the hose enough to start a leak. So I'm standing there processing what to do next. It was 10.30 in the evening. Of course, right? I found a possible solution and moved everything again, crawled behind the unit to work. The whole few moments combined colliding racing thoughts. The first was fear that I'm about to make this thing worse and I'm gonna have to change a cleaning endeavor into a very expensive plumber call if I can't get this thing stopped. There was also laughter because I recognized and was reminded of the frailties of my own abilities. And then there was gratitude because I stopped and was like, okay, Lord, I know you're in control. It's all gonna be okay. I prayed, I worked. And then I looked up at the picture that I kept hitting my head on on the wall. The image is from Colossians 3. It says, whatever you do, do it from the heart as something done for the Lord and not for people. Like what a great thing to remember doing frustrating work, right? And what a nice thing to have scripture around the doorpost of the house to help me remember. I think I've read about doing that somewhere else in scripture. The Lord heard my cry. I got the leak stopped and the laundry can once again be done with these amazing machines. That's something else to be thankful for, right? I didn't have to wash it by hand. Thank you, Lord. Not everybody gets to do that. While we wrestle with the main mundane details of life, endure the hardships of the world and encounter the scoffers of our day cackling in our ears, patience is key. When we get frustrated, it is easy to slip into the scoffer's mindset and declare, see, the Lord doesn't care. He wouldn't allow this hard thing to happen if he did. Peter says, dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. What the Lord one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is transcendent. His time frame is not our time frame. Kenneth Weiss, Weiss makes this comment. He says, the false teachers argue that the second advent has not occurred after so many years of delay. Therefore, it will not occur. Peter reminds them that God does not look at the passing of time as we do. He, in his eternal being, does not experience time as such, and the passing of a thousand years is no different to him than the passing of a day, so far as his predicted actions are concerned. Therefore, their argument is fallacious. 
His transcendence means that he, God, is above us. He's different than us. And he operates unlike us. Time doesn't constrain him because he is its author. The Lord does not delay his, delay his promise as some understand delay, but he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Psalm 33, 11 says, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart from generation to generation. We see in Ecclesiastes 3, 11, He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also put eternity in their hearts, but no one can discover the work God has done from beginning to end. Listen again to Ralph Brown from his book, The Model of Everything. Brown says, if things are going well in your life, you might feel confident in your beliefs, which is to say you trust your knowledge database. It's called having a strong faith. Or if things are going badly, if, if God does not seem to be answering your prayers or providing the answers you desire, you may question your beliefs. The situation implies you are having trouble trusting in your knowledge database. It's called having weak faith or perhaps just questioning your faith. Brown gives this chart. It's a little hard to see, I know, but there's the events of our time on earth, birth to death on the bottom there. If you go up on the left side, in the middle it says Q Sal, that's salvation. When somebody trusts Christ, salvation and then faith. Moving up and to the physical death side, moving up to glory, Q uh, glory on the top left there. That's the figure. Ralph says this, in figure 522, faith is just graphed as a variance of beliefs. We know the facts, but life circumstances unduly influence our intellect, whether reducing our confidence in them or, in a positive sense, giving us confidence beyond the facts. Note, he says, the faith variance begins at Q Sal. While faith can be applied to many aspects of our lives, when applied in a biblically oriented situation, the subject of our faith is and must be Christ Jesus. The subject of our faith is and must be Christ Jesus. In Jesus, there is forgiveness of sin and the desire of God to fellowship with his people. He came near to us that we might be close to him. If we hold on to his transcendent mercies, which highlight his patience, his long suffering, we can learn to be patient and rest in those mercies each and every day. And when we learn to rest in him, we don't have to fret the scoffers nor the upcoming judgment. Instead, we can walk peacefully and usefully with the Lord and one day experience the amazing reward of following him. We must run the race with endurance and we must fight the battle as the Lord commands. We must remember the words of truth. We must watch out for the scoffers. We must hold on to the transcendent mercy of the Lord and then we must repent, we must rejoice, and we must relax. We must repent. The Lord is patient with us. He is not delaying as we might think of delaying. He is giving his people an opportunity to repent in humility, learn to follow him in purity, and earn great rewards in glory. Repentance is having your mind changed by the transforming work of the truth, the word, and seeking holiness rather than selfishness. Is there anything that you need to repent of today? Are you trusting a political candidate more than your sufficient creator? Did you lose your temper over a broken appliance this week? Did you wrongly judge your neighbor and act unloving toward them? If those are anything else that violates God's commands, then repent. And after repentance comes much rejoicing. Rejoice. Rejoice in God's goodness and his faithfulness to forgive you of your sins. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Rejoice. Psalm 63.3, my lips will glorify you because your faithful love is better than life. Rejoice. And with rejoicing comes the ability to relax. I was speaking to Pastor AJ about our text for the day and he gave me this summary of the Lord's patience 
and desire for none to perish. AJ says this, he says, the message is intended to encourage believers in our waiting for the Lord's return. I believe it's in that context the wording is best understood. To paraphrase, AJ says, hey, chill out, guys. It's God's timing, not ours. The process of salvation is still in motion. Chill out, guys. It's God's timing, not ours. I think some of you heard this story before, but when I was in college, I auditioned for the singing cadets at Texas A&M. There you go. Thank you. Hey, we didn't lose yesterday. Some of you will get that later. Don't worry about it. <clears throat> I went to sing for the director. He looked at me and says, okay, you can sing. And then he told me to go see the gentleman upstairs that he was going to give me more information about uh, the, the group and the opportunity. I went upstairs. That man says, hey, come back tomorrow. At this time, I'll see you then. Great. Walking into the hallway of the choir offices that day, my heart sank a bit. There was another young man sitting in the hallway dressed in a suit. I was instructed to go sit next to that gentleman as my turn would be after this guy's. My heart sank because I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt. And the context clues told me that I was not dressed for the battle. A battle I didn't even know was coming. A few moments later, I stepped into this room staring at, uh, at a table of, I think, eight men dressed in suits, as if, as if I were walking into a congressional hearing. My heart pounded, and the questions began. After maybe two or three questions, one of the gentlemen says, have you ever heard the phrase, the clothes makes the man? My heart sank a little bit more. I knew what he was getting at, but I had actually never heard that phrase. So I replied, no, sir. Well, he says, can you tell me why you were dressed this way for an interview? I'm sorry, sir, I had no idea this was an interview. I was under the impression that I was having a quick conversation in the hallway with Mr. Smith. Well, he says, in the future, just know you can never be under, overdressed, but you can always be underdressed. Okay, thank you, sir. Isaiah 61.10 says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. I exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. And he wrapped me in a robe of righteousness. Now, I'm not convinced that the outer garments of a person are the true test of one's identity. After all, I was selected for the choir even wearing shorts and a t-shirt. But I am convinced, as a believer in Jesus Christ, that he has clothed me with the armor that I need to endure every battle of every day that he gives me life. He has clothed me with his salvation. He has clothed me with his righteousness. Hope is here. I am at rest in Jesus. I can chill out as AJ reminds reminds me because the, the Lord gives me hope. Hope is here because Jesus invaded my life and he holds me in his hands. The scoffers can't really hurt me. They might make my life difficult, but they can never take me away from my God. I don't have to put on a pretend costume to try to make it through the battle of the day. No, I have hope because I've been clothed with God's salvation and righteousness. And when I remember his word, watch out for the scoffers, when I hold on to his transcendent mercy, I can do the work that he has called me to do and be fruitful. When I think rightly, I can live rightly. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the reminder that for those that are in Christ Jesus, those who have trusted in, in him for salvation because he died on the cross and rose again and offered us life, those who believe in him are clothed in salvation and righteousness. That we don't have to pretend. We don't have to do it our own way. But we have been empowered by your spirit who lives within us 
to live in purity and holiness, goodness and grace, patience and kindness. We can exemplify the fruit because you have made us so. God, help us to remember the truth of your word that you are God, that you created the world with a word and that you will judge again. And I pray that you would help my friends and I to, to work diligently, to, to, to live rightly with you because we think rightly that we might receive the rewards when we get to see you one day in glory. Father, if there's anything that we need to repent of, I ask that you would pierce our hearts and help us see that, that we might be restored to relationship with you, to, to walk in more strength and honor. Help us to rejoice. Help us to rest. Help us to, to know the new mercies that you give us each day. Father, if anybody here does not know you, has not trusted your son, Help them to know that they are destined for that judgment, the fiery judgment that's coming because they are separated from you. And I pray that you would pierce their hearts right now and allow them to trust in Jesus, to call on his name for salvation, understanding that they are a sinner in need of a savior. And I pray that you would help them know that today, that they would receive new clothes, new armor, Father, help us live rightly because we work diligently to think rightly. Continue to use your word to help us see clearly. In Jesus' name, amen.